The Tertiary Education Trust Fund recently inaugurated a standing committee on research and development as part of its renewed drive to ensure that Nigeria's knowledge economy pays the proper dividend for economic transformation. The committee is working on 13 sector-based thematic areas tied to the deliverables of the Sustainable Development Goals. The paradigm shift will be focusing on some of these thematic areas over the next few episodes. This edition throws a spotlight on industrialization, manufacturing, trade and investment economy. Industrialization is the process by which an economy is transformed from primarily agricultural to one based on manufacturing of goods. Individual manual labor is often replaced by mechanized mass production and craftsmen are replaced by assembly lines. Characteristics of industrialization include economic growth, more efficient division of labor and the use of technological innovation to solve problems as opposed to dependency on conditions outside of human control. TET Fund is alert to the opportunities that industrialization and manufacturing can provide for the transformation of Nigeria's trade and investment economy. This is why the organization places premium on research and development as a necessary first step and inevitable ingredient for self-reliance. TED Fund's Executive Secretary, Professor Suleiman Elias Bogoro, is ever passionate to explain why investment in R&D will turn Nigeria's fortunes around. The industry is very important. That's why the academia now we are reaching out and uh, we moved out and we thank God. The, the industry is responding. We reach out to the Dangotes of this world, the uh, Innocent Motors, the Seplat, am I right? That's in the oil industry. Yes. We are hoping they will be coming on our R&D um, standing committee. We want to make a case for the establishment of national R&D foundation for Nigeria that should change the, the whole narrative about looking at the research just in a narrow context. No, the industry has to be a participant. The reason is simple. The industry needs the expertise of the best out there to understand what they require to add value to their products. The structure of the Nigerian economy is typical of an underdeveloped country. The primary sector, in particular, the oil and gas sector dominates the gross domestic product, accounting for over 95% of export earnings and about 85% of government revenue between 2011 and 2012. This did not significantly change in the years that followed. The industrial sector accounts for 6% of economic activity, while the manufacturing sector contributed only 4% to GDP in 2011. Engineer Mansur Ahmed is the president of the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. He is also a member of the leadership group of the TED Fund Standing Committee on R&D. He expatiates on how the paradigm shift will impact manufacturing in Africa's largest economy. I believe this will impact uh, the manufacturing sector and in fact the industry as a whole in many, many important ways. First of all, I believe that the uh, long identified uh, problem of the dichotomy between uh, academia, particularly research and development activities going on there, and what goes on in industry. Uh, this provides an opportunity for that gap to be bridged. In the past, uh, a lot of work going on in, in, in uh, universities and polytechnics and other research institutions aimed to produce solutions to problems that may exist and do exist in industry, never actually get to industry. Uh, and industrialists, uh, when they have their own problems, in most cases, they go outside to look for solutions. 
Uh, and I believe that this interaction um, and this partnership between industry and academia um, will help to ensure that a lot of the problems and uh, um, issues that arise in our industrial uh, sector may find solutions um, in, in the universities and in our research institutions. And conversely, a lot of the work that is being done in uh, these research institutions and in academia can now find expression and add value to what is going on in industry. So it's, it's, it's a symbiosis that is extremely important. One of the things we do at the university is teaching and research. But unfortunately, these researches have not translated into development. Uh, so we carry our researches because we want to get promoted, because our promotion is based on writing papers and all those things. So we have not moved from the basic research that we do to the cut edge research that we need to do. There hasn't been any linkage between the academia or no significant linkage between the academia and research for development, ones that can be industrialized and all those things. So the standing committee uh, is actually uh, a committee that has been put in place by Ted Fund to create that linkage, you know, to put up a framework, you know, a framework that we move, that we support a research that we have significant impact because what we are doing right now at the universities is a knowledge impact. And knowledge impact is an impact that uh, uh, research contributes within the academia. So it revibrates around the academia. So we are trying, this, this committee is trying to put up a framework that will move research from the uh, uh, tertiary institutions into a research or societal impact which means excellent res uh, research that we contribute to development impact in the society. The Economic Transformation Agenda, otherwise known as Nigeria Vision 202020, sets the direction for the current industrial policy in Nigeria. The industrialization strategy aims at achieving greater global competitiveness in production of processed and manufactured goods by linking industrial activity with primary sector activity, domestic and foreign trade and service activity. The success enjoyed by developed countries using these principles is not lost on the standing committee members who have observed with keen interest. Every country that has advanced in the area of uh, industrialization and development have had a research, a national research foundation. We can talk about things like South Africa, we can talk about Malaysia, we can talk about South Korea and all those places. So the national research foundations are put in place to ensure that there is a uh, a commercial, it's about commercialization and industrialization. You need to put in place a structure, a structure that bridges the gap between the two. So it's like, so let us talk about the, their roles, for example. It's like about a research, it's like bringing the, the research findings from the research institutions and finding correspondent uh, industry that we utilize that uh, that uh, research finding we know because other inst other nations other regimes other economies have um, been able to put to use this symbiosis to tremendous uh, opportunity uh, to tremendous effect um, one common example that has been used and has been acknowledged by everybody is for us the silicon valley where um, industries um, um, business activities link up with the uh, academia, research institutions to produce some fantastic solutions that continue to add value, not just to, to, to the business sector, but also to the economies and to the lifestyles of, of, the, of the communities they serve. If Nigeria is to keep up with the ever-changing terrain of technology, 
emphasis must be placed on producing tertiary education graduates who are not only relevant to industry but are also market ready. Indeed, and this is something that again we have we have known all along. Uh, the Council for Regist Registration of Engineers in Nigeria, Koran, uh, recently, about maybe a month or two months ago, came up with an initiative that seeks to introduce the approach to education, particularly education for engineers and technologies, called output-based education or outcome-based education. The intention is that you educate people to be able to achieve outcomes. So you produce graduates that can go into industry and become effective and add value. You, pr you produce research work that goes into industry and finds expression and use and adds value. So I believe that uh, this approach uh, now uh, through what is now called the triple helix um, is, is going to be vital to the development of, uh, of our economy and indeed uh, of, um, of, of, our, of our people as a whole. Um, we say triple helix because apart from industry and academia, there is also government because government has a great deal um, to do with this, uh, this partnership uh, because government sets the um, ecosystem by creating the policies and strategies and providing the enablement for both the academia as well as the environment for industry to succeed. So by bringing government, industry and academia together to look at how do we make education and the research and development work that higher education institutions provide, how do we make it uh, so that all parties involved uh, are going in the same direction. Paucity of funds has repeatedly been identified as a culprit that hampers research, development, and the industrialization process. The game changer, according to TED Fund's paradigm shift, is the application of the triple helix method, which brings industry as an investor rather than a donor. By introducing this output-based or outcome-based uh, education, by introducing this outcome-based research and development, you are already creating uh, an environment whereby industry can actually find the output of the education as well as the outcome of the research and development of immediate value and therefore should be able to invest in it. So clearly this should uh, significantly um, help to provide more funding directly from industry. Because it will not just be charity again. It will not be uh, corporate social responsibility. It will be an investment that every industry needs to make so that it will grow. There is a lot of distrust between the academia and the, and the industries. First of all, I think we in the academia actually do not understand about the issues of commercialization as it operates in the other countries. First of all, when we are talking, we are afraid that Oh, maybe if they come to know about my research, what about patency, what about uh, intellectual property rights and all those ones? What is the guarantee that when they have access to my findings that I'm going to be part of the beneficiaries of that? So there is a question of uh, 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 distrust. And then for them also, they have this idea that can anything come out of Jerusalem? The, 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 the industry. So you find out that they don't seem to have any confidence that anything can come from the ivory tower. I know, and this is where we need to bring the two sides together. You know, it, it, it's about knowing what we are doing and it's about building the trust and the confidence. You know, so if, in fact, when, you, when Nigerians go outside, you, when you hear about NASA, when you hear about so many, so many Nigerians are working there as scientists. And then you come to Nigeria as a scientist, you decide to come to Nigeria, you know, to come and work in Nigeria and the facilities are not there. So it becomes a problem. And I think that is where TED Fund is bridging the gap. 
because we can no longer complain that the facilities are not there because the facilities are being provided by third fund but then uh, we need to bring together the uh, is it the, the producers which is now the uh, uh, the research institutes and universities and then bring uh, also the developers let me just put it and we also have to bring together even the consumers because we are the consumers for instance if you have um, uh, an industry let's say a refining industry that is now having to import uh, some the, they call catalysts, for instance. Now, catalyst is about 80% basically sand, rock. But because of the way it is made, because of the way it is processed and prepared, it has, it, it has tremendous value. As at today, our finance industry is just having to import it at tremendous cost. But we have the basic raw material to make catalyst. And therefore, if we can work between industry and academia together with the government support and government funding and government assistance, we can actually uh, make catalysts, whether specifically for our industries or general ca catalysts that we can also not only use but also sell. In fact, in other countries, you find that even industries are funding research within the institutions. But here, it, it has not yet happened. How do we then bring them together and say, okay, now this is it? You know, so we, we, the place where we are going to start is, what is even available? What researches are available? What findings are available? All right, so if the industry do not know what the findings and the outcomes of the various researches that are take, taking place in our universities are, how can they begin to think about even commercializing? So there should be an interface between the researchers and the companies. That is the first place to start. And the second place to start is a needs assessment because each of these industries have a need. What is it that they want? I'm sure if we are to do a needs assessment of the industries, each of them have a research a focus, what they want. So which university is capable of producing that? So how do we link the universities, the centers of excellence, link them to the relevant uh, uh, industries so that they will be able to, 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 to undertake the research that we produce the product that they want? Since his appointment as the TED Fund boss, Professor Bogoro, the advocate of R&D, has insisted on greater intervention investment in content. This involves the improvement in quality of faculty of Nigeria's universities, polytechnics, and colleges of education. But why is this so important? Members of the R&D Standing Committee explain. The purpose of putting Nigeria at this level in 10 years, for example, we will need to catch them young. So we'll get a set skill sets that we will want that by the time somebody finishes primary school, those skill sets are already ingrained in him. If he goes to the secondary school ingrained. You know, here you see the colleges of education play a pivotal role. There are some rudimentary elements of technology that you can teach somebody at that age. He gets to the secondary school, goes to the polytechnic, which is designed for skills development, uh, basically. You get another set of skills which are going to be based on research to actually identifying the kinds of students that you're going to intake. What area are you going to deploy these students in terms of building his skills, what kind of skills based on his talent. So all these things, once they are done on the basis of research, you get better results. But then when you get to the university and you realize that what you are talking about is that you have to compete. You are not competing only between institutions of higher learning universities and all these things. You are also const competing with the industrial sector. But this is not to say that R&D should only be um, industry driven. I think there's some basic R&D that universities ought to make because part of the value of R&D is not just to produce uh, tomorrow's uh, products, but also to expand the scope of knowledge, to push the boundaries of knowledge. And that literally is something that the government needs to have to fund because today everybody accepts we are in a knowledge-driven industry.
And until and unless you can create an environment for your own people to actually own this knowledge and expand its boundary on their own, you cannot be said to be up there running with the hairs in the knowledge-based industry. This is where countries now are experiencing tremendous transformation, largely because we, we are no longer uh, a development in terms of human development, in terms of national development, in terms of economic development, is no longer dependent on basic resources. It's now dependent on talent, on the people's uh, uh, skills and the ability to innovate, to produce new ideas and transform ideas into new products and new services. I believe that this approach is now going to be absolutely essential for every country that expects to grow and develop. The structure of GDP in Nigeria during the last five decades shows the dominance of the primary sector, comprising of agriculture, mining, and quarrying, including crude oil and gas. At independence, the contribution of the primary sector to the GDP was about 70%. This share, however, dwindled in subsequent years to 62% as at 1977 and 55% by 1990 indicating a sluggish transition from primary production to secondary and tertiary activities. Although the primary sector's contribution to GDP climbed in 2003 to 68%, it declined progressively to 55% in 2011, revealing that more than half of Nigeria's output is still generated by the primary sector. The secondary sector, comprising of manufacturing, building and construction, contributes the least to the GDP in Nigeria. In other words, you are even ready to support those who are already in the production sector through quickly identifying their problems and, uh, I mean, and intervening. I've always uh, advocated the, I mean, the South African model in respect of that. South Africa carried out in their industry, they, find, they try to look at the level of industrial competitiveness. They looked at textile, that they were not competing well. What did they do? They challenged Cape Town University to say that, look, we want you to look at our textile industry. We want you to now see what will it take for textile industry in South Africa to be as competitive as textile industry in India. Because India is the benchmark. I mean, you know, India has years of history in textile. They said, our challenge is we want to catch up with India in the next four or five years. And the university, we want it to do. And what did the university? The researchers, first of all, they went to India. What is going on in India that is not in South African textile industry? And they were able to see, oh, pattern making, uh, the, the process technology, and so on. They came back and they started addressing all those issues. Within three, four years, the level of competition of textile in, in South Africa improved considerably. That type of challenge is where we are saying, why don't we share? And Nigeria will even do that easily because we have a number of people that can respond. So that's the type of thing that we're expecting R and D also we do, you know, to be able to look at our competitiveness in various sectors. Blue to oil. Agriculture was the ministry of our own economy. And also, also that we also made similar mistakes along that line. Why? Because all we were doing is agri-production. And you do agri-production and you what? Market the primary goods by selling them out of the country. Okay? We refuse to also consider the whole thing that those agricultural produce that we market, not only for eating purposes, they are also raw materials for so many other things, which we are taking chocolates and all these things. And so some of all these things are the same some agri products that have been processed. Okay, somebody buys cocoa from here, from you, goes there and brings chocolate to you. Why don't you develop the chocolate yourself using the main technique? So you now sell him the raw material for it, that means 
the cocoa as that and also refined products and lessons. But we are not doing this, we are selling this, but these people became smart. They don't have all this raw material, but because they can now process these things into edible or things, consumable goods, material things that we depend on, uh, basically, they benefit more. So we produce <laughs> the process, but somebody refines all these things and comes out with the product that you buy. With Tetfund's interventions, through the application of the Triple Helix Method, backed by the upcoming R&D Foundation and centers of excellence in each geopolitical zone of the country, success is inevitable. And that is the paradigm shift.